Well, good morning, Living Waters. How are you doing today? Great. Good, good. I'm so excited because today we enter week five of our series, The Greatest Storyteller. Everybody look at your favorite neighbor and say, The Greatest Storyteller. <laughs> now, some of you are like, oh, they're your favorite? <laughs> you know, you got somebody on both sides. But, but yeah, so the last month, we've spent looking at, in the Bible, the stories that Jesus told to teach his followers. And so we've clarified over the last four weeks uh, that those stories uh, are called parables, okay? And so a parable is an earthly story with spiritual meaning, okay? It's basically an earthly illustration to explain to us what God, or in the Bible it uses this phrase, the kingdom of God, and so that's God and how he operates, how all of that works. Okay, so today we're going to look at two parables uh, that I really think are going to help us, especially this next month of our lives. Okay, so the message this morning is called Enough. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, Enough. And now it's really important that you get like the tail lifting right at the end of that, okay, where, where it's very clearly a question. If you couldn't tell, I wanted to make sure that you knew it was a question because there's three question marks, okay? So the, the message this morning isn't enough, it's enough. And so uh, this week we're going to celebrate one of my favorite holidays, and that is Thanksgiving, right? And now there's so much to love about Thanksgiving. Uh, I love getting together with family. You know, you get to see some relatives that maybe you don't see any other time of the year. Or, you know, I love football on TV all day long. How many men will give me an amen to that? Yeah, I'm so thankful for football. I also love the food. How many else, who, who else loves the food around here? Yeah, me, I could have an entire meal of just stuffing and gravy, okay? I don't even need the turkey. I don't need the cranberries. If you just give me like five kinds of stuffing and let me have turkey gravy to pour over it, I'm good, okay? My uncle actually, he makes this creamed pheasant that is the best, okay? It is so good. So I love family. I love football. I love food. But there, there's really so much that we can love about Thanksgiving. And, and the last thing I love about it is just really the reason we have Thanksgiving. I love the meaning behind Thanksgiving, that we set aside a day to just become aware of all of the things that we have to be thankful for, right? Where we set aside some time to just say, you know, you know, I've got it pretty good. And I have a lot of things that I can and I should be grateful and thankful for. And now, I looked up some statistics here about Thanksgiving, uh, and this survey said in 2017, okay, last year, 41% of Americans said that they have more to be thankful for this year than last. So that means 41% of Americans had more in 2017 than they did 2018. Then 36% said that they have about the same to be thankful for. So that means that 77% of Americans say that either we stayed the same or our lives got better and we had more to be thankful for just over the course of a year. I mean, aren't we such incredibly blessed people? Amen. I mean, don't we have so much to be thankful for that we have clean water? Something we can so easily take for granted. Or that we have food every meal. That we don't have to make decisions based off of how many times we're going to eat this week. We think, what do I want at this particular time of the day, right? We have so much to be thankful for. But have you ever thought about the schedule right after Thanksgiving? <laughs> have you ever thought about how the very next day has started to be known as Black Friday? How literally a day after this day that's set aside for giving thanks, we go crazy over what we don't have, right? Like the very next day, people are going to camp out in parking lots and have human stampedes to the newest iPhone coming out just 24 hours after the day that's set aside to say thank you for what we have. Have you ever thought about that? We have Thanksgiving where we say, oh, I'm so thankful. I'm so grateful for what I have. And then we go crazy 
for the next thing. Where we go crazy about that next gadget we need to have or the next toy our kids need or something else. I don't even know what it is, but, but we all have our lists. So I don't say all this to say, hey, guys, this year, don't go and buy Christmas presents. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, I'm not saying this so then you feel guilty as you're going out and buying presents because no, we should celebrate Christmas. Just make sure that when we give gifts, it's noted that those gifts are pointing back to the gift of Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas, okay? So I'm not saying don't go out and buy presents. I'm not saying if you do, you need to feel bad. No, no, no. But what I want to make us aware, I want to make us aware of those things so that we can enter this season with a healthy mindset. I want to say those things so that we can enter this Christmas season with, with a real thanksgiving. And my prayer that through the message today, we would actually have thanks being given through the whole month of December. Amen? Amen. Amen. Because whether we like it or not, all of us have had times where we think about what we don't have. All of us have had times in our life where we have wanted something, or we feel like we just don't have enough, right? How many of you have ever felt like you just don't have enough time? By raising raise hands, yeah. Oh yeah, all the honest people raise their hands, everybody else is lying in church, okay? But no, we all feel like we don't have enough time. How many of you will be honest in church and say, you've had a time where you felt like you just didn't have enough help? Like, like there just are not enough good employees, or your kids just are not helping you enough. Can I get a good amen, everybody? Amen. Or how many of you have ever felt like you just you just don't have enough talents? Like you just felt like there was a time where like we just weren't enough. Or maybe, probably not for you, but for me, I've had times where I feel like I just don't have enough money sometimes. Anybody with me? Yeah. yeah. Where it just feels like, like I see what I made, I see the expenses, and they're, they're tipped the wrong way, you know what I mean? Where we just feel like we just don't have enough. All of us, if we're honest, have times where we feel like we just don't have enough. We don't have enough time, we don't have enough help, we don't have enough talents, we don't have enough money. So, I think a very important and a very helpful question for us to answer this year as we come into Thanksgiving, is to answer the question, how can we have enough? Maybe even more than that, how can what we have be enough? So to do that, we're going to look into the Bible, and it's going to answer that question for us in Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 1. So if you have a Bible with you, you can flip it open to Matthew chapter 20. You can click it open to Matthew chapter 20, or the words will be on the screen. And the Bible is going to answer for us how we can have enough. And Jesus is going to do that by giving us a universal principle of thanksgiving. He's going to give a universal principle that teaches us how we can have enough. So in Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 1, it says this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius, everybody say a denarius, for the day and sent them into his vineyard. Okay, so what's happening here is that it's saying the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, basically what God and everything that he does is like. He says it's like a landowner, and the landowner is God. A landowner went out early in the morning and hired some people to work in his vineyard. And see, what we need to point out here is that he agreed upon a fair wage, okay? He said, you guys come work all day and I'm gonna give you a denarius. And a few weeks ago, uh, we talked about this denarius, right? That in first century, a denarius was equal to one day's wages. That was a fair pay for working from six until six, okay? That's what they would get paid. It was just a common wage. And so these people didn't even question it. When this landowner went out and hired them to work all day for a denarius, that was appropriate. That was enough. That was considered enough. So then the story continues in verse 3. It says, about 9 in the morning, everybody say 9. He went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. 
He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. Because remember, for a whole day, it's right to get paid one denarius. So he went out again at noon. Everybody say noon. And about three, say three. In the afternoon, he did the same thing. Okay? He doesn't say what he's going to pay them, but he says, I'm going to pay you what's right. It says in verse six, about five. Everybody say five. In the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long and doing nothing? They say, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. Now, verse eight, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call all the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired at five and going on to the first. So what we know you need to know here is that the order of the owner was intentional. He was going to teach a lesson. This is Jesus trying to explain to us what God is like. And so the story continues. Verse 9. The workers who were hired about 5 in the afternoon came up first because they were the last ones, right? The people who were hired about 5 in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. Okay. But, but the people who were hired at 6 in the morning were hired to work 12 hours for a denarius. But these people who just worked one, they didn't receive a twelfth of a denarius. They received a whole denarius. Interesting. Verse 10. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. Everybody say more. But each one of them also received just one denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. I might too. Okay? And, and these who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. Basically, they came complaining, saying, wait a minute. People who just worked one hour, like, like they were just helping us pick up from the actual work that we did earlier. They came and worked one hour, and you made them equal to us. You gave them the same amount. So they started to expect that they would have been given more after they saw that. But they weren't. In verse 13, it says, But he, the landowner, answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? The answer is yes. Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. And here, here's the whole line wrapped up in one. It says, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? He does. Or are you envious because I am generous? So we have this landowner. He goes out and hires people at early in the morning, okay? That could be like 5, 6 o'clock, but it's probably somewhere right around there. He hires them early. He says, I'm going to pay you a denarius for the day. And the beginning of the story, that was enough. They worked hard all day because they thought that one denarius was enough. It was, it was reasonable. That was acceptable. But then he hired people at 9, and then 12, and 3, and then 5. And he paid all of them a denarius, which was way more than they deserved. So the people hired early, they were upset, they were jealous, they were envious of the other people once they saw what everybody else had gotten paid. But the owner says, don't I have the right to do with my money what I want? You're envious because I am generous. And now this isn't just talking about like how we as managers should pay our staff members, okay? That's not what he's explaining here. What Jesus is explaining is how God offers salvation to us. Okay, so the landowner is God. Clear in the story. The early workers in this time, okay, who Jesus is describing is the Pharisees, 
Okay, those were the religious leaders of the time, the people way up in Judaism, who would walk around and f see themselves better than everybody else. They thought that they were fulfilling the law, they were doing enough, and they were pleasing God on their own just by their works. And so they thought that they were receiving salvation as a payment for what they were doing. But see, Jesus tells us this story to go right against those religious people in first century Judaism. He tells this story to say, no, everybody receives salvation once they put their faith in Jesus, and we don't work to earn it. He's saying that some people are going to find Jesus, and working for the landowner in this parable is living for God. Some people are going to find God at a very young age, and they're going to live their whole life for him. And at the end of their life, they're going to experience salvation. That's the gift that they're given. It's not a wage. They're going to be given that. But then some people, they're going to find Jesus on their deathbed. And they're going to say, in that moment, I believe in Jesus. I accept him as my Savior. And they're going to receive the exact same thing. They're going to be given the exact same thing. And so Jesus is really like smacking the religious people right in the face with this story. He's like, you guys think that you work to be good enough for God, but, but you don't. You actually can't. We are given this gift through only faith in Jesus. And everybody's going to receive the same thing. But see... I said at the beginning that Jesus is giving us a universal principle that I really think is going to set us up for a good Thanksgiving. And I think could really make us thankful the whole Christmas season. And, and let's look at that last verse again, okay? Verse 15, it said, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? It says, obviously, yes. And he says, are you envious? Everybody say envious. envious. Because I am generous. See, the Pharisees, this isn't just talking about a landowner. This is talking about how the Pharisees started to become envious of this free salvation that Jesus was offering. Say, you don't need to work for it. You don't need to deserve it. I'm going to give you this gift, okay? And that gift is called grace. It's the free, unmerited favor of God. He says, I'm going to give that, that all you need to do is put your faith in me. You just need to... Accept me, Jesus, as your Savior. Accept me as your Lord. You just take it. I want you to have this. And the Pharisees didn't like that. They started become, becoming envious. And really, they started to think that maybe they were entitled to more. That maybe what, what was enough before isn't enough for them anymore. And see, envy is the universal principle that I want to talk about today. See, envy was the heart issue of the Pharisees. And that prince, that's a principle that affects more than just salvation. All of us, I think, can experience envy in our life. And so what I want to do today is really just, just help us have enough. I want to help us not allow envy into our life, allow jealousy into our life this Christmas season. Because all of us can become ungrateful for what we've been given when we compare it to what's been given to others, right? Yeah, so my point here, my big point, if you remember one thing from today, I hope you remember this, is that envy is the enemy of enough. Envy is the enemy of enough. Basically, this is how it works. Envy turns enough into not enough. And that's what it did for the Pharisees or the vineyard workers in this story. They went and worked in the vineyard, and at the beginning, it was enough. But as soon as they compared it to what other people were given... Envy set in, and then enough was no longer enough. And they came and asked him and said, shouldn't we have been given more? See, envy then makes us entitled to what is not ever ours. Envy makes us feel like we deserve something that we were never even promised, that have no right to. See, envy is the enemy of enough. And envy is this, it's feeling discontent or resentful because of someone else's possessions or qualities. We've felt that, that discontentment once you see what somebody else has. It's feeling like what we have is not enough because somebody else has more, right? Or it could be thinking less of ourselves or what we have 
because it is less than someone else's. The workers in the vineyard were fine with their wage until they compared it with everybody else. It wasn't until they saw what the other workers were paid that they became discontent with it. And see, here's the deal. Comparison can corrupt contentment. Comparison can, though, is the key word there, can corrupt contentment. When we start to compare, we can really do one of two things, okay? When we compare what we have or what we're given or what we are with somebody else, we can do one of two things. We can either choose to say that is enough. What I have is enough. Do I like that? Yes, but what I have is enough. Who I am is enough. Who I'm married to is enough. Who my kids are naturally is enough. Or we can let envy sit in. When we enter into a situation of comparison, we can either go the path of enough or we can go the path of envy. But see, I've heard a lot of people and I've actually heard pastors preach messages against comparison. Okay? That comparison is just a bad thing. Okay? And... And I said comparison can corrupt contentment because I don't think we can ever escape comparison. I don't think we can ever stop seeing what somebody else has and compare it to ours. I mean, there's just no way. If we are aware people, if we're attentive, we're going to notice that somebody else has more than us, okay? That somebody has a nicer car than us. We're going to notice that somebody has more toys. They have a boat and they have a four-wheeler, and that's more than us. We're going to notice that some people just, it seems like, have more metabolism than other people, okay? And it, just, it makes us compare, and we're like, why? Why does that person have that? There's some people who just, their kids are just like superstars. Like, they're going to be the next Olympian, okay? And see, we all experience comparison, but comparison isn't sin. It's when we go down the path of envy and we become entitled to, we want what was never ours in the first place. See, envy is the enemy of enough. Envy, if we go down this path, will take enough and make it not enough. But if we look at it, whatever it is that we've been given as enough, it'll be enough. See, so as we come into this season, we can't stop comparing, but what I would encourage us to is, is what if we just look at whatever we have when, when I see friends of mine who are driving these nice cars and I got this beat up Chevy Malibu that's literally, I don't even have a CD player, it's just an open spot right here, you see the wires coming through. When I see everybody else with these nice cars, maybe I would just say, God, that's a really nice car, that, that would be so nice to have, but, but God, what you've given me right now in this season, in this beat up little baby boo, in my heart, I'm just going to decide that that's enough. Someday do I hope to have something that is a little more reliable and breaks down on me more often? Yeah. But, but right now, I can either choose envy and just allow this car to not be enough. Then there's nothing I can do about it. We can't afford another one. Or I can say, you know, this is, this is enough for right now. See, what I have is no different. I see it changes entirely. So how can we have enough? This universal principle of choosing enough over envy. I want to just give us three quick tips for, for how can you do that? Because it's easy to say, like, okay, yeah, I'm just going to say it's enough. But then you look back at it and you're like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, help me, Lord, you know? But how, how can we have enough? Number one, I think we just see it as God's. We can see it as God's. The first step to beginning to see everything is enough is just to see it as God's. You see the workers, the wage was the landowners to be given. And they started to feel entitled to more, but, but it wasn't their job. He agreed to pay them a denarius. See, they had no right to start to question if what they were given was enough. It was agreed upon. And the landowner set the wage, and so it didn't help them at all to think about if what they were given was enough. There's nothing they could do about it. It just made the landowner mad at them and rebuke them. Because we can't, we don't have any right to question what we've been given. Because, see, the Bible says this in James 1.17. It says in the NLT version, because I just like the way it words it, it says, 
Whatever is good and perfect, so any good thing in your and my life, comes down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Meaning God is consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And every good and perfect thing that you and I have is a gift of God. So what that means is that when I look at that messed up Chevy Malibu, I need to see that as a thing, a good thing that God gave me. Because I'm not walking all around Alexandria. I've got a car. Most of the time, it gets me from my house over here to the church. But, but even though it's not that good, it's still a gift. The clothes that I'm wearing are good things that God gave me. The people he puts in my life are good things that God gave me. See, all of the good that we have is really God's. It says that every good and perfect thing in your life and my life is given to us from God. God's the one who determines what we've been given, not us. So we need to see everything as God, see him as the source, that everything good comes from him, and the correct response to those good things is gratitude. So the second thing we can be, or how we can have enough, or see what we have as enough, is to stay thankful. See, just imagine if the story would have ended with the people who went out early in the morning, Seeing everybody else get a denarius, they come, they receive their denarius, and they say, thank you. That was fair. And they walk off. Like, they could have just left, and the whole story would have ended differently. But see, they allowed envy to come in, and once they compared what they got with everybody else, then envy made enough, not enough. See, because they worked all day long in the heat, and it was enough then. But it wasn't until they saw what somebody else had been given that, that that comparison corrupted their contentment. See, isn't that the same way with us? Like, my car is fine until I look at somebody parked right next to me in the parking lot, isn't it, right? Like, like what I have, my house is fine until I walk into a mansion of somebody else, right? Like, what we have is fine until it's compared and that comparison is the doorway for envy to come in. So we have to stay thankful. Enough isn't just a choice. It's, it's that continual. God, it's enough. God, it's enough. God, I'm enough. God, my wife is enough. Or my husband is enough. God, my kids are enough. See, what if we just protected that enough? We stayed, kept it enough. If we find ourselves praying to God, telling him that what we have is not enough, I really think that's a, that's a warning light telling us that we've let comparison allow envy into our hearts, and now envy has become our means of measurement. See, if we find ourselves praying and saying, God, I just need more. God, I just don't have enough. God, I just don't have enough time. God, I just don't have enough finances. That should be our warning that, that now envy is our means of measurement that we've become unthankful. But there's one last thing we have to do. And so I want to jump to, to another parable. And it's just one point. It won't take too long. But, but just one other thing I think we have to do if we want to keep enough enough. And that's Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 11. The words will be on the screen. You don't have to flip there unless you're real fast. Okay, it says, While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. Another parable. And Jesus is telling him, because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Everybody say ten. So basically he calls ten people, gives each of them a mina. He says, put this money to work, he said. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. Ruby, you can come on up and play. Verse 16, it says, the first one came and said, sir, your mina has earned ten more. Listen to this. He says, well done. My good servant, his master replied. 
Because you have been trustworthy in the very small matter, take charge of ten cities. So then the second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. So it went from one to ten, and, and now this guy made five out of one. And his master answered, You take charge of five cities. He was just given five coins, but now he's given five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. So his master replied, I will judge you by your words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest. Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. But he cried, I tell you, to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. So if we ever find ourselves in one of those places where we're just praying, God, I just don't have enough. God, I just don't have enough. I just, I just don't have enough time. I just don't have enough resources. I just don't have enough talent to see this project through. First thing, we just need to see it as God. He's the source. If every good thing comes from Him, we need to be going to Him to get more. Because it's not ours. We can't get it on our own. We can't work up with it on our own. And then two, we need to stay thankful. We need to keep seeing what that was given as enough. And when comparison enters in, we need to just say, no, I'm keeping myself thankful. I'm staying thankful. I'm staying in the mindset that this is enough. And then lastly, the third thing we need to do is just make more of it. Make more of it. Because see, I think sometimes we come into these situations where we're like, God, I just don't have enough. But if we were really honest with ourselves, maybe our stewardship of what we had been given in the first place wasn't quite what it could be, right? You know, where maybe we're like, God, I just don't have enough time. I'm just frustrated. Would you just give me more time? And I think sometimes what he says is, was enough. Or sometimes if we're like, God, I just don't have enough money. I just can't pay my bills. Sometimes I think God would say, you know, maybe it's not what you were given, but maybe it's what you made of it. And so this isn't every situation, but, but I was just, as I prepped this message this week, I just have some situations in my life where I just feel like I just didn't quite have enough and God just checked my spirit. And I was praying for God to bring me more and I said, and it just popped in my head. But God, I know I need to steward what I already have a little bit better. That God, I, I don't have enough right now, but I'm gonna trust what I get to you. But God, I am going to make as much of what you've given me as I possibly can. See, there's this quote by Augustine that says, pray as though everything depended on you and work as though everything depended on you. See, and I've heard that before and I kind of kick back against it a little bit because, because I think in these situations, what I would... Say instead is, what if we work like it depends on us, but we pray knowing it depends on God? Because if we see everything good that we get as given to us by God, and I've been very intentional that whenever I talk about what we've been given, I haven't once said that it's a gift. Okay, grace in the, to the parable was a gift, okay? That's the free unmerited favor of God. But in the second parable, the mina wasn't a gift, it was an investment. And so what if we see everything you and I have been given 
every bit of us, every part of our lives, not just what we have, but who we are? What if we see our finances as an investment given? What if we see our childhood and the way we were raised as an investment given? What if we see everything good in our lives as an investment? I think then we would have a better picture because a gift is just like, oh, it's a gift. If I give my kids a gift, a gift they don't like, they just put it back and they pick up another one. But see, what we are, our lives are not a gift. They're an investment. And the difference is, is because the person who gives it expects something from it. See, God doesn't just give us our lives and expect it to be Amina and come back and be Amina at the end. God expects us with everything we've been given for us to make more of it. So as we approach this Thanksgiving season, there's some situations where you're going to be in a serious need. You've stewarded all you have as best you can. And you're just going to have to rest in the fact that it's all God's. God is the source. And you're going to sit back and say, God, I'm working as hard as I can, but I need you to come up with what I lack. And that's valid. But there's other times that, that when we come into the question of God, I just don't have enough, that we need, to, we need to check ourselves and say, well, God, maybe before I just expect you to give me more after, you know, maybe I didn't even make a one-to-one -one investment. Maybe I had like a one-to-80 like 80 investment of what you gave me in the first place. Because the Bible says that if we just go one-to-one, -one, He's going to even take what we've been given. See, God, God won't go over and above and pour out blessing on a person who's not even going to steward it, you know? If it's just going to be wasted, he, God doesn't waste anything. But if we, if we make more of it, we say, God, I'm hunkering down on my finances. I'm going to make sure that everything you give me is allocated to a place. I'm going to go, I'm going to live off of 90%. I'm going to honor you in the 10%. And I'm going to make more out of 90 than what I could have without you with 100. Amen? That God, I'm going to take this car and I'm going to pull up a YouTube video and I'm going to figure out how to install this radio right here that maybe we take what we were given and we make more of it. And then the amazing thing is, is that once we do that, God shows up. See, God saves us when we're doing our best and we're still in need. He will miraculously provide, but he also provides more when we've made more with what we've already been given. So there's two, we need to, we need to trust it. It's God's, every good thing is from him. We, all, we also need to make sure that we're making more of it in our hearts. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word here. That as I studied it this week, it, it just, it just, you convicted my heart a little bit. And it seemed like I just didn't quite have enough, but when I when I evaluated and sat and reflected, I just thought, you know, you know, I could maybe, I could maybe steward what you've given me already a little bit better. God, so if there's anybody in here today that that's where they are with you, God, where it just, maybe this would be the correction that, okay, maybe I need to hunker down in that area a little bit. Maybe I need to I need to steward a little bit better. Maybe I need to just make a little bit more of what you've already given me. God, I pray that you would just strengthen us. Holy Spirit, would you just strengthen hearts? God, that we would leave this place not condemned, but we would leave this place challenged. And see, the difference between condemnation and challenge is condemnation means we're going to stay down. A challenge is that we're going to get back up and we're going to walk again. We're going to walk faster. We're going to walk harder. We're going to continue. We're going to press on. So God, over all those hearts, in my heart here today, I just pray that you just strengthen us in your Holy Spirit. God, to press on. God, to make more of what you've given us. But God, also in this room, I know there's some people who are working as hard as they possibly can. That they are giving it their all. They're trying. They're working. They're not working out of an obligation to you, but they're just working because they love you and they want to steward what they've been given. But God, it just still seems like what they don't have is enough. What I know is, God, you are the giver of every good thing. And so it's not our responsibility to wonder about where the more is going to come from. God, it comes from you. And so, God, we give you those things. We trust you in those things. God, I pray against anxiety in the name of Jesus, that that would just dissipate, 
that people would know that they can rest in you. If they are working as hard as they can for you, God, you are the provider. It's not them. It's not that father. It's not that dad. God, you provide for that family. God, and when they honor you, you take care of them. So God, I just pray your blessing over those situations in this place today. God, I pray over every one of us that as we enter this Christmas season, God, we would see what we've been given as enough. That we would acknowledge that you gave it to us. That we would constantly choose enough. We would stay thankful for it. God, in whatever we've been given, we would just work it as much as we can. God, so then we're not just having enough for us. We get to be a blessing to those around us. So God, I pray that over every one of us today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. God is the source, amen, of every good thing. Whatever it is that we need, whatever it is that we lack and we desire, God's the source. So church, I just want to send us out this week just just looking at everything we have is enough. I pray that my wife would look at me this week and see me as enough. <laughs> you know? When I look at my boys, you know, I pray that I would just see enough. I would see the potential of what they could be, but, but right where they are right now, they I just hope I see them as enough. And over you, I just pray that you would choose enough. This Thursday, this whole month, Maybe even after that, that we would just live lives of enough, amen? And then 